and welcome to the arbitration conversation. So in the arbitration conversation, we like to have discussions about different topics and hot topics. Um, and often it turns out to be something about motion practice or how to draft an arbitration clause or maybe a new case that came out. Well, this time we're actually gonna talk about something you're never supposed to talk about, politics. So for this special episode on politics, we have Brian Farkas. Brian Farkas is somebody who I've been following a long time. He's been a teacher at different universities in New York City. He's also an attorney at Arndt Fox there in New York City. And currently, he teaches arbitration at Cardozo Law School. So Brian, thank you so much for taking time with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I, I like that introduction that like something we're not supposed to talk about it that I hopefully that will really make that'll entice our viewership. I like that. Exactly. I should have said maybe we can work religion in and then we'll really like <laughs> make sure we get to, you know, talk about everything. So we're going to talk about politics. All right. And so when we think about politics, you know, sometimes arbitration, we think it's apolitical. It's just a process. But maybe do you have a different take on that? I mean, what does Trump have to do with arbitration? So it's a really interesting question. And I think that um, there are sort of two schools of thought on ar both arbitration and kind of civil procedure law more broadly. One school of thought is that it's it's a political procedural rules and it's stuff that every every lawyer really needs to know. And then there's sort of the deeper level of analyzing the um, political ramifications, both on a sort of personal level um, and the, the types of individuals that are affected, the types of claims that are affected, and also at a broader level of looking at um, state politics, federal politics, federalism, and of course the relationship between the, the two different political parties. Um, so I tend to be more in the, I'm sort of at the, in, in the middle of those two um, opinions, but um, I'm sure we'll get into some conversation about how we can teach both of these things at the same time, but I tend to, to have one foot in both camps. <laughs> So when you say that though, maybe let's explore that a little bit. So what are these camps? And maybe you can articulate a little bit better about what the camps are and kind of where you fall. Sure, so just from a, um, a teaching perspective, I tend to start teaching arbitration. Um, arbitration is a, a really great subject because it involves concepts from contract law and also concepts from civil procedure. And so when, um, when you're teaching it, you're usually teaching it to a group of uh, 2Ls and 3Ls and, and LLM students who are taking it as an elective course. And it's actually very useful because it, it, it serves as a reminder, a refresher of a lot of those um, concepts, again, from contract law and CivPro that they had in their first year. Um, so I like to teach the nuts and bolts and um, I've watched all of your arbitration conversation videos so far and um, I teach the obviously the, the motion practice stuff and the um, kind of how to draft a clause stuff. Um, that, that's all really important from a, a practitioner standpoint about um, how you as a lawyer, a litigator or a, an in-house corporate lawyer will um, use arbitration agreements and draft agreements and then of course how you would, would litigate them in, in arbitration or if you need to, needed to go to court to make a motion to confirm or a motion to vacate. So obviously I think any, any basic course on arbitration needs to cover that stuff. It needs to cover the, the, the how-to and the, the kind of situating arbitration within the field of procedural law um, and understanding kind of where the Federal Arbitration Act fits into everything. Um, so that's kind of the basics. But then I really think that there is a huge political element to arbitration. And I, I'm, of course, not the first one to, to, to say that or think that. This has been um, kind of in the ether for, for decades. And there are many scholars who have, have written about this and who have taught um, about the political ramifications of arbitration way, way, way before me. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking of all the names, and there are too many names of, of professors to, to even say, but I'm thinking of Miriam Gillis and Jean Sternlight and Stephen Ware. Um, there are so many, uh, and yourself, um, there, there are many professors who have written about the um, kind of political aspects of arbitration. But I think that this moment is just such an interesting moment in kind of American arbitration history 
to really delve a little bit more deeply into the um, into that connection. And I've found in particular that students are really, really interested in the political intersections with procedural law. Um, and you always think, I think as a, as a one L certainly, you think like, ooh, con law is gonna be the really sexy class. That's gonna be the one that has all the, the political ramifications and has all the, the drama and um, all the excitement. And you know, I think that that a good teacher of of procedural law can really show how those dramas actually play out in what would seem to be the sort of maybe more dry um, rules of civil procedure. The actual where the rubber hits the road of politics is where facts and law are are interpreted in the courts. And so I, I think we can really use arbitration. Um, use politics within arbitration and, and dispute resolution courses more broadly now in, in these couple of years, certainly in the past couple of years and the next couple of years, while um, certain political characters are, are in office, which we'll, we'll get into, um, I, I think this is a real moment for ADR teachers to use that to bring these concepts um, to light in new ways. Yeah, I mean, I 100%, I mean, the one thing that you said earlier is something that resonates with me even from the very first days, like 24 years ago when I first was starting to teach arbitration and just thinking about how it's the perfect way to kind of bring in all these different elements of law. I love that you brought that up. You know, there's the constitutional issues, there's procedural issues, there's contract issues. They're kind of all coming together in one place and certainly politics play in, you know, and you do, I mean, we see, of course, there's the obvious, right? There's the FAIR Act, there's, you know, the AFA when that was presented, there was what happened with the CFPB. So there's the kind of the legislative issues, right? But now let's kind of delve a little further. I mean, how, what would you say, for example, would be the Trump administration stance with respect to arbitration versus a Democratic Party stance on arbitration, if there is one? There, there definitely is one, uh, and I think that it was it was probably harder ten years ago to really give a concrete answer to the question of the politics of arbitration. Now I think it's it's crystallized. So I think if we're looking at um, President Trump, President Trump is is just a really interesting character for dispute resolution um, professors and dispute resolution practitioners to think about um, because he really is the most pro-arbitration president that we've ever had. And I don't say that as, a, as either a criticism or a judgment or anything. I just say that as um, just factually, he's been personally involved with arbitration to a greater extent than probably any other president who's ever occupied the office. And so he, just him as a character, I think is really interesting. Um, for students to understand, because one of the things that, that we certainly teach about in arbitration courses is where do you actually find arbitration used? And sure enough, one of the industries where um, arbitration is most frequently used, almost exclusively actually, um, in many forms, is um, real estate construction development, which of course is where Donald Trump comes from. So he emerges from that development world where um, essentially every contract, most contracts, come from the American Institute of Architects, the AIA. Um, the form contracts that are promulgated by the AIA are, are, are um, ubiquitous in those industries. 100%. Yeah, I don't know if you know this, but actually my background before I started teaching was construction law, and that's kind of how I got into arbitration. So as you're speaking, I'm like picturing 100% Trump Tower, all these buildings, of course, that they had to have had arbitration clauses. I'm preaching to the choir, yeah, <laughs> um, exactly. So I think that, so we know, and a quick search of Westlaw tells us that um, the Trump organization and Trump himself is no stranger to arbitration, but it's also useful to recognize that his other sort of, um, I, I don't even know if you could call it a side hustle, but his other career was really in the entertainment industry. And we also know that as an entertainment industry executive, he was personally involved in arbitrations. Um, two that come to mind that were particularly um, well reported were um, there's one with, with NBC in, I believe it was 2015 when um, he uh, made those derogatory comments about um, Mexicans coming across the border and in his campaign announcement and NBC basically said they're, they're gonna cut ties with 
um, Miss Universe. And so there was an arbitration clause in their contract and that actually went to arbitration. Then there was another one, I think it was in 2012, where there was a Miss Universe um, or Miss USA um, winner who um, said derogatory things about um, Trump and about the competition. And so there was actually, a, uh, again, a, an arbitration agreement there. And we know that that also went to arbitration. And then we haven't even gotten to maybe the most well-publicized example of Trump's use of arbitration recently, which has been, which was the um, settlement agreement with um, Stormy Daniels, where uh, that agreement was negotiated by Michael Cohen, Trump's former attorney. And that settlement agreement, it, among other things, it provided that she would uh, remain silent in exchange for a payment of $130,000. And that agreement included an arbitration clause, which um, it seems like a million years ago, but uh, that was the um, lawsuit that made Michael Avenatti burst onto the public stage where um, she was, was suing to invalidate the arbitration clause and confidentiality agreement within that settlement agreement. So in other words, we know that, that Trump is very pro-arbitration and has personal experience, personal comfort with arbitration. We also know that he said a lot of really publicly um, derogatory remarks about um, sitting judges and about the public court system. So the, those comments are, are also well documented about um, judges' ethnicities and um, judges who were, were not um, running trials in the way that he wanted them to be running them, comments about Justice Ginsburg. All of it has been very well publicized, but it sort of overall paints this picture of a person who is both comfortable and familiar with private adjudication through arbitration and also someone who is really not as comfortable with, with public adjudication um, and the, the sort of separation of powers, classic idea of, of the public court system. So I think it's fair to say that Trump is, is a very pro-arbitration character and is really a good teaching example of someone who has used arbitration in really all many of the different ways that a person can use arbitration, that a business can use arbitration. So I would say that that's a, a uh, a summary of, of kind of where he stands on, on those issues. Well, and kind of to your point about um, pedagogy and talking about teaching, I mean, it doesn't have to be political in a way that's, you know, making students feel, you know, uncomfortable on either end of the spectrum, because really it's more just using it as an example of places where real people, people in high offices are actually using arbitration, right? And so it gives you that sort of different ways to use, to use arbitration. In right. contrast, and so, I mean, it, it's a good, so in contrast, if you could maybe um, also your views on what you would say the Democrats um, say about arbitration. Right, well, well, first on that point, I, I actually use um, the, the settlement agreement and um, arbitration clause that Michael Cohen used um, drafted with Stormy Daniels is actually a matter of public record at this point. So I've actually used that as a teaching tool um, in, in the context of showing how arbitration clauses are drafted. And that one actually has a lot of problems with it. Um, so it's, it's a good example of how um, clauses can, can work or not work or what can change. And I think the, the kind of dramatic details of the story really bring it to life for students in a way that maybe a dry construction arbitration clause would not. Um, so about the Democrats, so, so the Democrats have had actually since 2016, in their 2016 um, party platform, they, the party came out publicly against um, the use of what's known as forced arbitration clauses in employment agreements. So the party, technically speaking, has been um, against forced arbitration clauses in employment since 2016. Um, but having said that, I would say that it's a, it's a little more spotty when you look at the, at the individual states, certainly, and, and what the states are doing. And if you go back further than 2016, it's, it's really less clear that there's like a red-blue split on how different um, political actors view arbitration, whether they're, they're pro or anti. It, it's not really that clear, or at least not really that consistent by party lines. But I think also it depends on the way you're using it, right? I mean, I think, um, you know, if you, for example, if we're talking about just the existence of arbitration in the construction industry, I don't think you're going to see very many, 
people that are against it, quote unquote, right? So I think it just depends on the context in which you're using arbitration, right? So are you talking about employment and consumer and civil rights claims, or are you talking about business to business claims? Exactly. And I think that there is an emerging consensus within the Democratic Party that really has, I, I think, only really started to fully crystallize in the last four or five years that it's the consumer and the employment um, and the civil rights, th those causes of action that are the problematic ones. Um, and so I think now that we're in the 2020 election, it's been much clearer and um, the, the candidates who were the most, uh, I don't know, the most uh, aggressive towards arbitration, the use of arbitration in those contexts, Elizabeth Warren, a former law professor, was out on the campaign trail in full force talking about mandatory arbitration, which is um, just, again, great from a teaching perspective, <laughs> um, because you can bring out the, those real examples of um, how the sort of quote unquote dry material connects to a, a real animated politician. Um, Julian like, Castro, yeah. Bernie Sanders uh, as well have been very vocal. Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting also because I'm thinking as you're talking just kind of different aspects because as we were noting that the area of arbitration of course involves so many different areas of law and, and even separation of powers, right? Because even to some extent what happened with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau having come out with a proposed rule, they passed the rule, but then the rule is retracted with um, Mike Pence casting the, the deciding vote. And it was really kind of a drama, right? But a political drama really playing out with respect to separation of powers and arbitration. Absolutely. And it's um, a much more um, sort of procedural issue than you would expect the vice president to be called on to <laughs> cast a deciding vote. Um, but I, I think that really does show that there is an emerging party consensus between the two parties. And I, I, just to sort of um, bring it to our current nominee, um, uh, Vice President Biden, Biden has been, he, he also throughout his campaign has been, um, had a statement on his website that has been against uh, mandatory employment arbitration. He hasn't had a statement against consumer arbitration in the way that, that Elizabeth Warren did. So I get the sense that he is a bit more moderate. He certainly has not been on the, out on the stump um, talking about uh, mandatory arbitration, at least that I've seen, um, whereas Elizabeth Warren actually was. Um, and you know, it's it's funny. Last night was the um, was the Democratic National Convention where Joe Biden was formally nominated, and I was sort of gosh, wow, yeah. When you really stop and think about all the different ways arbitration has come into politics, it's really kind of overwhelming because it's not it's not something you think about right away but again I love the way you've talked about from your pedagogy and as a teacher how you can really work that into your classes you know and really kind of bring life to some of these issues that otherwise may seem a little dry or stale um, definitely not dry or stale when you think about Stormy Daniels and all <laughs> Michael Bolton and whoever else that, um, who's been involved in all of these different issues of arbitration I mean Absolutely. also I would say yeah, I mean, are there other thoughts or other ideas? I love this idea about bringing the, in fact, I'm going to steal it, um, bringing the contract and, and bringing it to class. I love that. Are there any other sort of ideas or, or thoughts that you have, especially about as you teach your class? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I always try to emphasize is, and I think there are different schools of thought on how you teach law, whether you teach it as a sort of advocacy um, that you're advocating a particular position or that, that one side is right and the other side is wrong or, or whether you try to be a sort of neutral or a neutral broker. Um, and I'm sort of in the middle of those two things. I don't see myself as advocating any particular politics around um, business to business arbitration being good and consumer arbitration is bad. Um, I think the, the when you're taking an introductory course like arbitration, just a basic intro to arbitration, it's important just to give students the vocabulary, the language, the tools, uh, so that when they have clients in, in the real world, they can sort of um, 
give the clients a, a full and fair accounting of what their options are. We always talk about uh, as ADR people fitting the forum to the fuss. And I think of arbitration uh, not as inherently good or bad, but I think of it as a tool. And like yeah. any other tool, it's something that, that you need the right tool for the right job. And there are arguments that are, are policy-based and also um, practical that would counter for or against the use of arbitration in different contexts. So I try to present a, a full version of, um, of the way that arbitration can be used. I, I, I assign professors who are law review articles of professors who are extremely on the left and extremely on the right of, of how they view arbitration. And I think it's, it's just great to have a discussion about the policy objectives behind what seems like such a dry procedural um, area of law. Yeah, you know, and I think that's important. I'm gonna say also, I'm, I'm where you are, I'm in the middle. I mean, I'm not someone who's ever going to sort of force any politics um, of any particular side. I think what's the most important, again, as professors and as problem solvers and as dispute resolution people, um, as you noted, you know, really just kind of giving the full picture of how all of these different tools have a time and a place and a way that they can be helpful to your clients um, in order to solve problems, because that's really what we're trying to do at the end of every day. Absolutely. And I, you know, I remember reading in CivPro, Iqbal and Twombly, and I think that when you're, when you're just going through those types of procedural cases for the first time, it's really hard to understand where it fits into the broader political narrative. And so you read those in CivPro, as you just said, because you, you need to get the nuts and bolts, but then when you're, when you're a more advanced 2L or 3L or LLM, then you can kind of look at those cases and see where they fit into a broader political narrative. And that's sort of how I see all of this in connection with arbitration, that once we teach the basics, once we teach the vocabulary, then we can have a, a more nuanced conversation about the policy ramifications of different arbitration um, doctrines and laws and usages. So yeah. overall, I, I, I'm a fan of, of teaching the politics of arbitration to elucidate some of that, um, some of those learning points. Well, gosh, Brian, it's been a really interesting conversation and I really thank you for taking the time. Um, interesting stuff, a lot to chew on, really fantastic. So thank you so much, Brian. Thank you. I'm a big fan of the arbitration conversation. Thanks so much for having well, me. You're in it now, so <laughs> have a great day. You too.